consensus protocol will work, is to not over constrain it. So thinking back at a, a user level, if um, I, I have a transaction in Seattle to buy something uh, with with the, the Rev token, and you have a transaction in New York to buy something else, um, they don't need to be uh, go through the same consensus algorithm unless they're involving the same vendor addresses or the same payer addresses. Um, and this this is where it gets a bit difficult for me to explain exactly how we can make those claims. Um, but let me ex ex extend um, a bit about the node topology and what the blockchain shape looks like overall. So as, as you all know, um, that both Bitcoin and Ethereum, all the transactions around the world are put into blocks and are essentially um, sequentialized or stacked on one blockchain. So all the nodes have the burden of synchronizing the blockchain. And it's brilliant, but it doesn't scale particularly well. Um, so what our chain does is, is it relaxes that constraint and it allows uh, different nodes to care about different sets of transactions and contracts, smart contracts, or programs more generally. Um, and it does that through the use of namespaces. Um, and then namespaces are a, a traditional computer science thing. Uh, you can think of it similar to a URL or a path um, that's hierarchical, um, where you can address a particular name by its path, or vice versa, a name is given context based on its path. But with, um, with this, uh, by calculus, um, it, it doesn't have to be just a tree and have a name live only in one namespace. A, a, a name can actually live in multiple sets of, of um, expressions, which is also uh, another aspect of namespaces. So going back to nodes, is um, a node then can uh, be configured to care about a particular set of contracts, a particular set of user accounts, um, and then uh, only care about the interactions with those accounts. And as long as there is enough um, validators in the uh, consensus cycles so that the uh, double spend is prevented and uh, given a surety of, of, of the uh, redundancy that's needed in a blockchain, um, that will all scale. And then, you know, New York, most of New York's transactions and most of Seattle's transactions can truly be independent of each other. And then occasionally there'll be some that aren't, uh, and and those will be go through a different level of consensus, requiring nodes that care for a particular address of, in contract about both of those sets. So um, that's um, the simple way that I think about how our chain will scale, and we're still working through um, both explaining this as well as building it, um, but the mathematics support it very directly. Do you guys have a follow-up about that? So, so with that concurrency model then, like your data structure isn't a series of blocks where each block is a list of sequential transactions. Maybe I missed this, but can you talk in a high-level way about what sort of the actual data structure is? Are you still calling it a blockchain? Are you not? Do you hear that? So he's wondering how, how we can call it a blockchain if it's not sequential or, or series uh, transactions. Exactly. I, I appreciate the question. And um, uh, in a sense, uh, there's some aspects of our chain that aren't a blockchain in the data structure sense. Um, you know, in, in similar to Ethereum, there's a, a tree structure, T-R-I-E, um, in terms of serializing what's, you know, on, on a node and and, and from a transaction perspective, it looks more like a graph, actually. Than, uh, and it's not, uh, I don't think it's even a directed acyclic graph, it's a more general graph. Um, and these things can be um, ind independent of each other for sections of the blockchain. So um, it's, our chain is not precisely a blockchain in the sense of Bitcoin and Ethereum um, in, in a couple of ways. In that data structure way, where you are allowing this concurrency and, in, and relative independence, um, uh, but there's another way as well, which is uh, in in our chain, the storage, 
will actually be leased. So, um, you know, some transactions will be kept in the system for a long time as, as because, because of the redundancy that's needed uh, and the eventual finality as, as you go through the consensus. But especially for, for larger content, um, it's, it's, it's place in the blockchain will require um, a, a deposit that will uh, create a, a lease agreement with the protocol. So unlike other blockchains that have this guarantee of immutability that once it's on the blockchain, it'll never change or that, that storage will never change, our chain actually won't make that guarantee unless it's paid for. So this is another way in which the uh, our chain will actually scale. Because there again, that's it's it's a great, interesting promise, but it's not free, right? It's it's actually quite a burden on um, Ethereum and our uh, block, excuse me, Bitcoin nodes to not only run all the transactions around the world, but keep all of them forever. So who would who would uh, pay for that uh, lease? So it it'll be paid for uh, up front, actually, um, during the transaction. So some small part of the fee will. Um, um, will go to that storage component, um, that lease, and who will reap the benefit of that will be the node operators that will prove they're, they're storing that data over time. Uh, so how does that relate to, um, uh, uh, Jorge, maybe you want to weigh in here, how does that relate in terms of your, your concurrent fabric model? Well, I wanted to see how, how deep a question I could ask, but um, would, would you say like each, each, each VM is incorporating a bad loop with each other VM, or is there a different uh, concurrency model? It's more granular. Jorge, I understood part of that. You were talking about how VMs communicate, and I didn't understand the whole sentence, sorry. Be before we go into the, the this, this uh, um, data structure, like data structures, uh, what's the concurrency model that each EM, that each node in the network follows in order to coordinate state transitions? So like a state yeah. channel with lightning? I yeah, yeah I, I understood the, the essence of the question. Um, uh, it's, it's actually a, a challenging technical question for me personally to answer, but let me just give you a flavor of it. Uh, this, this, is exactly the, the mathematics of concurrent processes, where the, the VMs at a per, you know particular time are evaluating a particular contract or a program. The program may have a dependency on another program that's not even necessarily on its own node. So it needs to you know pass a message or a transaction to an, another contract, and whether it's on the same VM or a separate VM. Uh, the same thing is happening where uh, all of these interactions are asynchronous. Um, there's a call out. Um, the, the calling contract will um, essentially uh, go to sleep. In, in other words, it will be, um, its state will be serialized and stored on the blockchain as its next state. The other uh, contract will receive that uh, call essentially asynchronously it'll wake up um, run that transaction that transaction may be a call back to the first and then the first one will wake back up and, and uh, continue so um, the the notion of a, a transaction uh, in our chain is much more granular involving all of the messages between um, programs not simply with the transactions that are initiated from the user or, or the account. Does that give you some flavor? It does, it does. Um, so in order to, for, this, uh, uh, for VMs to start participating on, on, on um, a contract or something that initiates a transaction, um, they need to become aware of each other. Uh, what is the, the, the um, security model? What is it that enables them to know, hey, this VM is authorized to with each other VM. Is it like permissionless? Is it permission? What's the security model? Yeah, I, I actually don't know how to answer that one. So let me make sure I, I'll paraphrase the question to see if I heard it. What is the security model between <coughs> contracts or programs? How do they know about each other? How can they call each other? Yeah. Um, 
you know, they find each other through uh, namespace resolution. Um, and the nodes can be um, configured such that they have permissions over, you know, which namespaces they even listen to or care about. So that even with the same software, with some configuration, you could say, this node is truly a public um, blockchain or a public node. It, it can be open to any of these uh, namespaces. Or even, even with that, you can say, uh, but it doesn't want to uh, take on namespaces that require, you know, gigabytes of storage for, um, you know, for, for, for news and short movies and music, for example. Um, it, it may just choose not to, not to want to work in that and only wants to work with very small financial transactions, as an example. So the namespaces, or sorry, the nodes declare what namespaces or what qualities of namespaces they care about. And in inside of a corporate setting or a consortium setting, it may, may be very restrictive to say these nodes only want to listen to these certain IP addresses and these only these namespaces so that it can be tightened down in that way. At least that's the that's my my understanding of the initial design. So so basically we're talking public blockchain first and then tightening through ACL like uh, permission for uh, Yes, um, so we our goal is that it's the same architecture and it's just configuration through access control list and etc for for tightening it down. Hey, uh, I, I, um, my time is getting a bit tight. I, I've got a lot of demands uh, with this uh, membership drive and private token sale. So yeah. let's maybe just take one more question. Yeah, and, that, that's uh, fine. Uh, I want to know what's what's going on the, with the like uh, you're wrapping it up. Like, uh, what's the what's the how did you do? With, with, uh, can, I didn't I didn't hear the question. Like Sorry. With your with your membership drive, like um, what kind of. Uh, Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, we've been having this membership drive and private token sale for about three, three and a half weeks now. Mm -hmm. We've uh, closed and uh, completely closed uh, about uh, $5.5, .5, and that's in, taken in a combination of Ether, Bitcoin, and a little bit of U.S. dollars. We're still um, uh, pulling, uh, you know, the submissions uh, and, and requests from today. Uh, and we have a number of people we've yet to follow up on. It's been, uh, we've, in terms of membership numbers, we have uh, at least uh, 300 members or 250 to 300 members total, and a, a large chunk of that uh, amount has come in the last several weeks, and so that's awesome. The R-Chain Cooperative is a membership-driven organization, so having that um, a group of folks that care about the future of blockchains is really important to us and, and, and our decisions in the future. Um, in terms of the fundraising, we, we still have yet to close several of our rock purchasers and um, uh, and there are individuals also that are coming back sort of a second time as they realize the opportunities of someone that maybe started um, three weeks ago at $50,000 uh, sometimes they're coming back for another fifty thousand dollars, et cetera. So it's really exciting. It's it's a bit crazy, frank, frankly, but it's a good crazy. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Congratulations. That's a that's a great. Result. Oh, thank yeah. thank you so much. I've really I've really enjoyed uh, uh, meeting with you. I was I was um, out at this space at the uh, end of May and would love to come out to Pencil Works soon again. Cool. When can thank those you, of us who don't everyone. have fifty thousand dollars buy some some uh, Membership stakes. Is there going to be like a smaller? All right. Uh, Ed, when, to... when, is the, when, when can people who aren't accredited investors get in on the crowd sale? Yeah, I, I need to run, but uh, so uh, we don't have a locked in crowd sale. Um, I expect it's likely that rocks will be listed on an exchange, although the, that's kind of up to the exchanges. The co op's not pushing that. Um, the launch of the R-Chain platform is approximately a year from now when we'll convert or redeem the ROC token for the REV token. And 
certainly at that time, if not before, revs will be, uh, sorry, at that time, rev will okay. be on an exchange. But I think there's going to be opportunities uh, much, much earlier. Okay, guys. Great. Thanks so much Thanks for your time, everyone. Ed. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye.